because I want you to hear me. So my wife went out of town. She's at my uh, daughter's in Texas, and she just finished her first week of work as a nurse at Hughley Hospital in Burleson, Texas, where my youngest daughter, Sophia, was born. So how neat is that, right? My youngest daughter was born in Hughley, and now my oldest daughter is working there. So they went there to uh, celebrate. Sophia turns, uh, man, she turns 16 here next week. So I'll fly out sometime next weekend and spend the weekend with them. But happy Sabbath. For those that are online, happy Sabbath. My name is Pastor John. I'm glad each one of you, whether online or in person, are worshiping with us in the Shehala Seventh Avenue Church. I know it's a little challenging with the Mass, and I'm going to talk a little bit about touching today. So I remember growing up, my parents always said, don't touch, you know. Oh, usually when it was dating involved. I hope you brought your Bibles with you. Let me open mine up. All right. The sermon title for today is Asking for the Body of Jesus. Asking for the Body of Jesus. Wednesday this week, I was studying a little bit about Nicodemus, as we talked about in the children's story, and Joseph of Arimathea. And you may say, well, I haven't heard a lot about either of these two men. Nicodemus, a little bit more, I know he was a member of the Sanhedrin. However, though, Joseph of Arimathea, the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about. And as I was studying it this week in Bible studies and in my own worship, I felt more and more impressed I need to preach about them. It's hard to preach about people in the Bible that you have very little information on. But which is interesting, you know, the Gospels, right? It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when you read the Gospels, some of the Gospels, like the prodigal son, only Luke talks about the prodigal son. Um, the woman that was healed by touching the hem of Christ. Remember, she was bleeding for 12 years, and she touched Christ's garment, and she was healed. Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk about that story, but not John. So when you read the Gospels, they don't always cover the four different perspectives. Interesting, though, with Joseph of Arimathea, all four Gospels talk about him. But yet, I've never heard a sermon preach on Joseph of Arimathea, and today you're going to hear one. And the title is, Asking for the Body of Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you speak through me. May we ask for the body of Jesus as Joseph did. We may not understand the context right now, the reasoning right now, but Lord, I believe there are life principles that are applicable in our life today. Would you show us in Jesus' precious name? Amen. Which you, many, many of you probably know, I was a police officer 15 years before a pastor. All my training is never hold anything in your hands. So the reason why I wear a head mic is because I never hold anything in my hands. So if you want to put me in an uncomfortable position, put something in my hands. Plus, you know I talk with my hands. And it's sort of hard to do this. But I'm going to do it today, so it's going to be a fresh one for you. Here we go. Asking for the body of Jesus. When I was growing up in college, I went to Washington, D.C. my first year of college. And I loved, in Washington, D.C., all the monuments. And the Washington National Cemetery was one of my favorite places to go. Who's been there before? Let me see. Hold them up high so I can see. So a few people. Okay, so you know you have John F. K. Kennedy's memorial there with the eternal flame and his brother Bobby not far from him but I love the memorial 
for the soldier, the unknown soldier. And for those of you that haven't been there, you need to put it on your bucket list. It is a must. Are you going to hear a lot of talking? No. You're going to hear complete silence. But you're going to see something worth remembering. So I was there, and they have, it's a very crowded area. It's very popular there. And they have this tomb with an unknown soldier. So there's no name marked on it. And there's a soldier, full gear on, rifle, everything, that marches. How many spaces? 21. Back and forth. Exactly 21. And it's precise. He does exactly 21. He stops at the same spot. He goes 21 spaces back and does it again. Exactly. And it's interesting as the crowd is quiet, we're counting. You can hear everybody breathing. And it's precise. It's like, how many times does he have to practice this? What is even more interesting, though, he does 21 steps down the black mat, behind the tomb, turns, faces east, 21 seconds. Then turns and takes 21 steps back and repeats the process. Well, uh, you know, thank goodness it's only a couple hours during the day. No. It's 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Right now, there's a soldier marking in front of, in front of the grave. What's that showing? Respect. What's that showing? Honor. What's it showing? The soldier gave his life so that we can have life. Now we go over there and we honor the grave. Even though we believe the dead know nothing, we're honoring the grave because now we have freedom to do what we're doing right today. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, all these different freedoms. He's greatly honored and he deserves it. In the Bible commentary, it says, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had been intentionally excluded from the Sanhedrin trials of Jesus. They were both part of Sanhedrin, the Jewish trial of Jesus, and they were excluded. And the Bible commentary says, for in the past they had spoken in Jesus' favor. So if someone's going to speak for Jesus, and the Sanhedrin's goal was to get rid of Jesus, what do you do? You take the two mountains two men out, or you plant it behind their backs. However, now they boldly step forward to do what no friends of Jesus were in position to do. They asked for the body of Jesus. So let's read about it here. Let's read about it. If you would, go with me to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Verses 57 and 61, Matthew 7. Verses 57 through 61. Now when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea, and his name was Joseph who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. We don't hear that very often. And what is a disciple? A follower of Jesus, right? This man, Joseph, went to Pilate, verse 58, and he did something very specific. He asked for the body of Jesus. Today's sermon title is Asking for the Body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body... He wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. He laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. He cut it out of the rock and rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. Mary Magdalene was there and other Marys sitting opposite the tomb. Okay, this was Matthew's account. Matthew makes up part of the four Gospels. Let's look at Mark. Mark also talks about Joseph. Let's go to Mark chapter 15. 
Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, verse 42 through 47. Mark chapter 15, verses 42 through 47. This is how Mark now depicts the story. Now, when evening had come, because it was preparation day, it was Friday, right? Preparation for the Sabbath. That is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent city council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage. I like that. Mark put, coming and taking courage, went to Pilate, and he asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead. Normally, when someone was on the cross, you know, the Romans had a way. um, I don't think we really understand how terrible the cross is and was. You were nailed to the cross. Usually, you died of suffocation. So when you're nailed to the cross, your hands and your feet, and they have this little pedestal for your feet, you're trying to barely breathe, and you're trying to hold yourself up because you can't hold yourself up. So basically, at some point, you die of suffocation. So usually, it's a long death. They don't want you to die instantly. They want you to die over a period of time to cause you the most pain. It was ruthless. So Pilate was, like, surprised. Jesus was already dead, and he summoned the centurion, who's a soldier, and he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion guard, he granted the body to Joseph, for Jesus was dead. Verse 46, then he brought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in linen. He laid him in a tomb, which had been hewn, again, out of the rock, rolled a stone against the door of the tomb, and Mary... Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, observed where he was laid. So very similar, but there's a few points that were different. Let's now go to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, verse 50 and 56. Luke chapter 23. 50 and 56. You know, interesting, if you have an event, the events, who tells you about the story? The witnesses. That's why we're going to all four of the witnesses to see their perspectives. Luke 23, verse 50 through 56. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man, He had not consented to the decision indeed of who? Whose decision? Sanhedrin, right? He did not consent to that deed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. So all three have said the same thing in the part of asking for the body of Jesus. Pastor John, what's so important about asking for the body of Jesus? We know Jesus is dead. We talk about Gethsemane and the walk to the cross. We talk about the resurrection, and we love talking about the resurrection, where Christ is resurrected, and he's not in the tomb anymore. But don't miss the part about asking for the body of Jesus. All four gospel writers wrote on it. Joseph Arimathea is hardly anywhere in the Bible except for here, So don't miss it. What are they trying to say? Verse 53 of chapter 23 of Luke. Then he, Joseph, took down the body of Jesus, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that was hewn out of the rock where no one had ever lain before. That day was preparation, Friday, Good Friday, and the Sabbath drew drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after They observed the tomb and how the body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragment oils, and they rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. All right, now let's go to John 19. John 19. 
John 19, 38 through 42. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, so he states the same thing, but secretly for fear of the Jews. All right, so he's a little more, well, why don't we hear about Joseph of Arimathea as the disciple? Secretly. He's part of Sanhedrin. How can he be a disciple of Jesus? For fear of the Jews. He asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus from the cross. And Nicodemus, who was at first, came to Jesus by night. Remember in John 3, I talked about the children's story. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Why? So nobody would see him coming to Jesus. You have a Jewish leader of the Sanhedrin who people went to them to find the answers. But Nicodemus did his own searching. He says, I want to know why Jesus is so different, why he dresses different, why he talks different. Jesus of Nazareth? What good thing ever comes from Nazareth or Galilee? There's something different about him. He came by night, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. Don't miss it. 100 pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus, both of them. They bound it in strips of linen with spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in that place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in that garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews. Preparation day, the tomb was nearby for the Sabbath. You know, these days we're told to stand six feet apart. It's probably for a good thing. But we miss out on communication and personal touch, what personal touch brings. Now, you know we have different love languages, and one of the love languages is actually touch. And for some of you, touch is probably your number one language. The personal touch of a handshake. Happy Sabbath. The personal touch of a pat on the back, communicating. Love you, brother. Love you, sister. Maybe the bear hug we're missing in 2020. Not seeing many of those right now. So I wrote a definition of touch myself, and this is my definition. Touch expresses an intimacy of depth. More than just words, it represents a physical presence of affection. And genuine touch brings an unadulterated tenderness. I miss touch. I miss the handshakes. I miss the pats on the backs. I miss the bear hugs. Nicodemus and Joseph asked for the body of Jesus. You know, it's one thing to see something happen. It's another thing to be present And it's even more powerful when you have to touch the body of Jesus. So we know the woman in Matthew 9, there's a woman that bled for 12 years. And for 12 years she bled. And the Bible says, she said, if I can just get near him. The crowds were around Jesus. He was healing his sick. She couldn't get near him because there were so many people. But she pressed forward. She had been bleeding for 12 years, and she said, if I can just speak with him? No, if I could just touch, not even touch Jesus, just touch just the hem of his garment, just the hem, just the bottom part. If I can just touch that, I will be healed. You know the story in Matthew 9. Did she touch the garment? She did. Was she healed? She was. 2020, I'm missing out on the touch. When I was in college, working my way through college, I had breaks, spring breaks, summer breaks, and I worked in a hospital. I've always enjoyed jobs of service. When we serve others, we forget about self, and actually we're rewarded, at least I feel a reward, of helping someone that appreciates it and needs it. And even if they don't appreciate it, they need that. 
There's something about serving others that really is a blessing. You know, if you, if you have a lot of problems in your life, I challenge you this week, instead of dwelling on that problem, find a task of helping someone do something. And maybe it'll be something you don't even want to do, and then do it, and then see if things don't get better in your life. So I was working in a hospital, and, you know, I, I was working on my undergrad, so I didn't have a whole lot of education at the time, and it was one of my first jobs, and I was a patient transport. And what that means is I had a little rolling gurney, a little, little bed that rolled, and I would go from hospital room. And Now, this was a huge hospital. This was over a thousand bed hospital. This hospital is like the size of a small city. So when you walk in it, there's many, many rooms. So all day, there was about 15 of us pushing patients from the room to x-ray, to CAT scan, to back to the room, to radiation, you name it, whatever appointment they had in that hospital, we would push them there. And during that time, you know me, I enjoy a good conversation. And I love people. I made friends with a lot of people in the hospital. And I saw many of them leave healthy. And it was a blessing. And during that time where, you know, if you've been in the hospital, how many people have been in the hospital and you were the one in the bed? You were the one in the bed. Let me see your hands. Okay, so only the ones in the bed are going to understand this. When you're in the bed and you're wearing that gown that doesn't cover anything, you're vulnerable. So when someone comes in and pays you a little bit of attention and they're trying to respect you, make sure that you get where you're going, and they actually care about you, it makes a difference. I appreciate our nurses and our doctors and the people in the hospital that when I'm the most vulnerable state that I've been in, they're taking that extra time. Maybe they sit down in the chair next to me and they say a little prayer. Maybe they ask about my family. Maybe they do more than their job. And I know we have a lot of those people here. So I was working my way into the same thing as service. I would introduce who I was and I would go to pick them up. I'd, I would get their last name and the room number. That's what the dispatcher would tell me. Then I would leave my area in the basement of the hospital. I'd go up to whatever floor that was. I would take the patient to wherever they were needing to go, and I had their last name and their room number. And sometimes it would take 40 minutes to get from one side of the hospital to the other side. It, it, I'm telling you, this was a big hospital and lots of people. So during this time, I met a gentleman named Mr. Gordon on the sixth floor. And Mr. Gordon had a long stay at Riverside Methodist Hospital. And I got to know him over a long period. And there's 15 to 20 of us patient escorts. So not every time that he was moved to a different area for radiation, he was actually fighting cancer, I didn't always get to take him. However, the dispatchers found out that he and I had a relationship. And every any time the nurses called down for Mr. Gordon to be moved to that department, the dispatchers would say, John, hey, you want to you take it? I'd be like, yeah, I'll take that. And what I really liked about Mr. Gordon, I was trying to encourage him, but here I am, this new college kid, and he was encouraging to me. We talked about his family. We talked about his children. We talked about his grandchildren. We talked about birthdays. We talked about special events. And, you know, when I pushed him in the hallways, I'd be sort of slow because I enjoyed the conversation. Not that I didn't want to push the next patient, but I wanted to hear more about what Mr. Gordon had to say. Talking about touch, not only did he and I touch physically because I had to move him from the bed to the gurney, but he touched my life verbally, words of affirmation, right? And hopefully I touched his life verbally. I even remember a time that we prayed together. Yeah. At Christ's death, Joseph boldly went to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus. Now, this request was astonishing. We've read the verses on Joseph of Arimathea. You know what I know. So why is this so important? Don't miss it. His request was astonishing because Joseph stood to lose everything by that request. His wealth, he was a very wealthy man as we read. His influence, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. His reputation, and even his life, 
Jesus had just been nailed to a cross, falsely accused. He was everything. Many of us could just say, well, why? Why ask for the body of Jesus? He's dead. Yet regardless of the cost, Joseph and Nicodemus' request was granted by Pilate. Joseph returned to Pilate, returned with Pilate's order for the body of Christ. Nicodemus came bringing the costly mixture of myrrh and aloes. Remember, a hundred pounds. What was their agenda? Listen to this. The most honored in all Jerusalem could not have been shown more respect or honor in death by these two men. While the disciples feared to show themselves openly as followers of Jesus, Joseph and Nicodemus came forward. Unlike the night where Nicodemus hid and came to Jesus by night, they came forward, seen by anyone that was out there. The help of these rich and honored men was greatly needed. They could do for the dead master what it was impossible for the poor disciples to do. So they did it. I love the book, Desire of Ages, and it says this, and I quote, With great sympathy, reverently and gently, they removed with their own hands the body of Jesus from the cross. You turn on the news, someone dies. Not a big deal, unless it's a person related to you. We see it every day. You go out to the scene of a death, it becomes a bigger deal. But maybe you don't know them. Maybe you're just interested to be that onlooker. But you move the body onto the gurney, and you touch someone who touched other people and healed them when he touched them, and now he is dead. You become touched. Their tears of sympathy fell fast as they looked upon his bruised and lacerated body. The body of Jesus, together with the spices brought by Nicodemus, was carefully wrapped in a linen sheet, and the Redeemer was laid in a new tomb provided by Joseph of Arimathea. By the way, that was his tomb, and he gave it to Jesus. Desire of Ages, page 773 and 774. Unbeknownst to Joseph and Nicodemus, their choice to put Jesus in this tomb fulfilled prophecy. Why do I believe in the Bible? Because of prophecy. The Old Testament predicts the coming of Jesus. Part of prophecy, Isaiah, over 600 years ago, before Jesus' death, predicted this, and it says, Isaiah prophesied and spoke 100 years before Jesus' death, almost 600 years, and he said, he was assigned to a grave with the wicked. If Joseph and Nicodemus hadn't gotten Jesus, they would have just thrown him in a criminal grave, with whatever that would have been at that time. But with the rich at his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Isaiah 53, 9. That prophecy was fulfilled at that time as they placed him in the grave. This is one of the many prophecies that have confirmed Jesus' identity as the Messiah and Son of God. Nicodemus witnessed the fulfillment of what Jesus had said three years earlier before concerning the lifting up of the Son of Man. Go with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Nicodemus Nicodemus had come to Jesus by night. Here he was, the great teacher of that time, coming to the presence of the greatest teacher of all times. And Jesus says, John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most surely I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 4, but Nicodemus said, and this is a good question, how can a man be born when he is old? He could have said why, but he said how can he be born again when he's old? 
verse 14, now it's starting to make sense for Nicodemus. Verse 14, Jesus told him, as Moses was lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What does that mean? Christ would be lifted up. When that serpent was lifted up, the people of Israel back in Numbers were saved. Nicodemus is now putting together that conversation back with Jesus in the very beginning when he met Jesus face to face. And Jesus said something about Moses lifting a serpent up and the Son of Man would be lifted up. Nicodemus now understood that. Jesus was lifted up. And now Nicodemus has the privilege, the honor, the respect to take him down. Nicodemus, when he saw Jesus lifted up on that cross, remember the words spoken that night in the Mount of Olives. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The next verse says, And whoever believeth in should not perish, but have eternal life. And then our next and our favorite verse comes, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So what was Joseph and Nicodemus truly asking for? What had Christ told Nicodemus in chapter 3? To be reborn again. And God is answering that question for Nicodemus now. How? Through Jesus' broken body. When we take communion, and I know we haven't had communion in 2020, the devil's good at shutting down a lot of different things, right? Because it requires touching and moving and washing. We haven't been singing because of the spitting and all that. It's amazing how the devil's trying to take away our worship. But if you look at communion, what do we talk about? The broken body of Christ, right? Listen to the words. I'm going to read them here to you. Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Christ's body was broken on the cross so that we could be reborn again. Now Nicodemus and Joseph gently touched the dead body of Jesus, removing it ever so carefully from the cross. They want to honor the greatest sacrifice ever given, willing to risk all. They want what Jesus promised all, those, all those that Jesus touched, to be healed and born again. Let's read Isaiah 53, 5. I don't want you to take my word for it. Isaiah 53, 5. Back to Isaiah again, prophesying about Jesus. Another prediction of the Messiah, another fulfillment of prophecy, another reason I believe in the Bible. Isaiah 53, verse 5. And it says, But he, Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Do you see the process here? Do you see the thinking here? Do you see how the picture of the puzzle is getting tied together and they're seeing it here? By touching Jesus, by touching his broken body, and they were giving him respect and love and honor, which the world had tried to take away. They were healed. They were healed. So as we often say from the pulpit, Jesus has given everything, all heaven, for us, a broken body, so that we can take part in asking for his body. 
that we may take part of being reborn again in spirit and in truth, as the Bible says, that we may take part in touching his body that was broken for us. Will you ask for that broken body of Christ today? Even if it costs you scorn, even if it costs you persecution, even if it costs people to look down upon you, even if it causes you death, are you willing to touch Jesus? For Jesus promised and said, he said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Nicodemus and Joseph took a huge risk by asking for the body of Christ. You often hear me say, we do not have because we do not ha ask. James 4, 2, we do not have because we do not ask. They asked for the body of Christ. But moreover, they were making a point, a divine appointment of their need to touch the body of Christ. And again, I want to remind you, the woman that was bleeding for 12 years in Matthew 9, 21, she said, if I could just touch him, I will be made well. Now it is and was finished. Jesus had proclaimed from the cross, it is finished. Death was defeated, and Jesus held the keys to victory, and he still does today and forevermore. And I love this two-word sentence, Jesus wins. Jesus wins. As Sabbath was approaching, Jesus now rested. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and all that is within it. And on the seventh day, he rested. He came into this world as a baby. And on the seventh day, he rested even in death. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it says even in heaven, in Isaiah, we will celebrate the Sabbath with them. So it had been a few months, and school was about ready to start again. I was about ready to go back to college, and I had one, one or two weeks left, and I was still in the hospital, having the pleasure of pushing patients around, making new relationships, learning skills of life, of communication, learning skills of service, learning skills of sympathy and empathy, learning skills of blessings, of be able to serve others as Nicodemus and Joseph served Jesus. So I was down in the dispatch room and I was sitting among the other transporters waiting for the next call. And the call came out from Mr. Gordon. So we got the last name, we got the room number. But the location was different. I was familiar with that location. I'm familiar with that location in my prior jobs. I'm familiar with that location today. Transport Mr. Gordon to the morgue. You know, often people don't know how to deal with death. It's not natural. It's not the way it's supposed to be. And my friend who was a dispatcher looked at me and said, John, are you sure you want to take this one? I said, you better believe it. I want to take every opportunity. Give him the respect he gave me. So I took the gurney to the room. Mr. Gordon was in the back. I had the privilege and honor to remove him from his bed to that gurney. I had the privilege and honor to take him to the morgue. And I believe I will have the privilege and honor to see him again someday when Jesus comes because Nicodemus 
and Joseph were willing to touch the broken body of Jesus. There may only be a few sentences on Joseph of Arimathea. I've never heard a sermon on him. There only may be a few more sentences on Nicodemus. But they had it right. They may not have had it right in the beginning, but they had it right at the end, and that's when it counts. Brothers and sisters, Jesus gave everything for you and for me so that someday we might be with him forever. But we need to be willing to ask. We need to be willing to ask for the broken body of Christ. We need to be willing to touch the broken, whipped, pierced, bruised body of Christ, so that someday we can be born again, starting today as we give our life to Jesus, and someday receive those new bodies on that great day of his soon return. For Jesus did proclaim, I am the resurrection, I am the life, and by his stripes, God's word says, we will be healed. May God bless the reading of his word.